All right, well, we're going to be in Mark chapter 15 this week. We're going to do the whole chapter. I'm really enjoying this, just kind of moving through chapter by chapter. And uh, not as many verses as last week, so we can breathe easy a little bit. Not a lot, but a little. And so uh, let me pray for us, and we will dig in. Heavenly Father, we love you, and by faith we know and we believe that you're here, that you indwell those who have called upon your name, and we have gathered here to worship you, and we know that you inhabit the praise of your people, and that our praise rises to the heavens as a pleasing aroma unto you, and it's all because of Christ. It's all because of what Jesus has done on our behalf, that Anything that we have to offer is found pleasing and acceptable in your sight. And we celebrate. We celebrate the cross. We celebrate the sacrifice of our Lord and Jesus. We celebrate the resurrection from the dead. And we, we thank you for the assurance that we now have the hope of eternal life, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for all the promises that are ours in Christ and that in Christ they are all yes and amen. And so I thank you for this time. I pray that as... As I share your word, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would minister to the hearts and the minds in this room. Not only our hearts, but our hearts and our minds, Lord, that we would be be interested in these things, that it would be intriguing to us, fascinating, but that it would impact us, Lord, in our hearts, and that it would minister to us, and that we would be encouraged, refreshed, challenged, convicted, and all for your glory, Heavenly Father, all for your glory, and it's in the name of your precious Son that we pray, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, so today, as is uh, titled in your notes, we're looking at the trial, the death, and the burial of Jesus. The trial, the death, and the burial of Jesus. So let's pick up. I guess let me just say this before we get going, just kind of frame your thinking a little bit. It's not going to be an overly practical message, but what I want you to understand, what I want if, if nothing else hits you, is just to understand as much as we possibly can humanly the immensity of what Christ underwent, the suffering that, that He went through for us, uh, for us, and I, for you specifically, and for me individually, corporately, individually, and, and I hope that that impacts you, whether you're not a believer whether you're a new believer, whether you're a, a possibly a backslidden believer or a, a mature believer, everyone in this room should be impacted by what we're looking at today as we consider the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ. This is inescapable. There's nobody that escapes this. No matter who you are, where you are in life, this should affect you. And so that's my prayer. So moving in, verse 1. Immediately in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. Then Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered and said to him, It is as you say. And the chief priest accused him of many things. But he answered nothing. Then Pilate asked him again, saying, Do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you? But Jesus still answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. So, as I have mentioned many times before, Mark is very condensed. But as you put all the the Gospels together, we kind of understand what happened over the course of the night. Jesus was praying in the garden. We talked about that last week in the Garden of Gethsemane when He was betrayed. Judas came in and betrayed Him with a kiss, and He was arrested, and He was let off to his trials. And this would go over the course of the entire night. So first, he was taken to Annas. Annas was the former high priest in Israel. So first, he was led to Annas's house, and he was put on trial. And then from there, he was taken off to Caiaphas. Caiaphas was the current high priest. He was actually the son-in-law of Annas. And so Jesus was put on trial there, and ultimately he was condemned for blasphemy because they asked him, just come on and say it. Are you the Christ? And Jesus said that he was, and that he would, we would see him coming in the clouds with glory. And the the high priest ripped his clothes and said, what more do we need? You've heard it from his own mouth, blasphemy. And so now they're going to cart him off 
to Pilate, but they have to wait until early in the morning. And so there was probably a little bit of a holding time. And then Pilate is up, so they take him to Pilate. Pilate hears him. Pilate really doesn't want anything to do with it, so Pilate sends him over to Herod Antipas. And Herod rendered no judgment. Herod sent him back to Pilate. And so that's, that's where we pick up. That was the course of the night with Jesus as far as his, his trials went. And now we're, we're dealing with Pilate. Pilate was a governor. Pilate was a governor in Rome, and he was present in the feast during Jerusalem because there would be a huge influx of pilgrims. It would swell, and there was always concern of riots. That was kind of the big thing that, that they were most concerned about. And those who were in charge in Rome, it was their job to keep the peace and to make sure whatever happened, there was no uh, civil unrest or uprising. And so Pilate would take that very seriously. That was his job, to maintain civility. And you'll notice that when they brought Jesus to him, their charge was, this man says he is the king of the Jews. Now, is that what they uh, condemned him for earlier? No, it's not. They charged him with blasphemy for saying he was the Christ. So this is clearly a manipulation tactic because they know that Pilate would not care at all. Pilate's not going to care uh, about their religious ordinances and, and rites and rituals and that this guy says that he's a Messiah. That would mean nothing to him. They had a multiplicity, a plurality of, of gods, and they just didn't care about that. But to say that he was a king, that was totally different. That brings it over into the political realm. And so now he's saying this guy is making himself an enemy of Caesar, who you work for. And so they were basically tying his hands, so to speak. They were putting him in a position where he had no choice but to act. He was being manipulated by the religious rulers there. But Jesus answered nothing. Pilate said to him, is, is this true? And Jesus said, well, it is as you say, but he, he didn't answer. And Pilate marveled at this, and understandably so. I am sure that Pilate was used to people groveling and begging and pleading because truly he did have the ability to con condemn people to death, to crucifixion. He knew it. They knew it. But Jesus didn't do that. And Pilate marveled. Pilate marveled. And this is uh, prophetic. That's another thing I'm going to point out as we go, guys. There's so much prophecy being fulfilled in this chapter, and I'll highlight that as we go. So um, Isaiah 53, 7, you have it there in your notes. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Jesus didn't fight back. Jesus didn't argue. Jesus didn't try to save his life. Jesus went silently. This was the reason for which he came. He knew it. And so he wasn't trying to get out of it. He was steadfast. So moving on, verse 6. Now at the feast, he was accustomed, that is Pilate, he was accustomed to releasing one prisoner to them, whomever they requested. And there was one named Barabbas who was chained with his fellow rebels. They had committed murder in the rebellion. Then the multitude, crying out, began to ask him to do just as he had always done for them. But Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd, so that he should rather release Barabbas to them. Pilate answered and said to them again, What then do you want me to do with him who is called the king of the Jews? So they cried out again, Crucify him! Then Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they cried out all the more, Crucify him! So Pilate, wanting to gratify the crowd, released Barabbas to them, and they delivered Jesus after he had been scourged to be crucified. So evidently, Pilate had begun to release people, prisoners, political prisoners to the crowd during the time of the feast, probably just to try to win and maintain some sort of favor with the people. And we're told here that, uh, that people came forward and said, you usually do this, it's time, so let us have one of our prisoners. And so he says, okay, how about Barabbas? And so he says, you can have Barabbas or Jesus. And Barabbas was a notorious criminal. This is in your notes. He was one who had committed robbery, insurrection, and murder. Basically, there were guys, zealots, people who were basically homegrown terrorists, 
and they hated Rome and they wanted to overthrow. They were rebels. They wanted to overthrow the yoke of Rome. This guy was uh, guilty of robbery, insurrection, murder. Uh, he may have belonged to one of the rural guerrilla bands that victimized the wealthy upper class of Israel as well as the Romans, and they were therefore popular with the common people. And so he says, you can have this guy, you can have Barabbas. Interestingly, his name means the son of the father. You can have Barabbas or you can have Jesus, the king of the Jews. Who do you want? And they cried out, crucify Jesus. Away with him. They wanted Barabbas. Now, it's interesting little note here that Pilate knew that it was because of envy. Pilate knew that it was because of envy that they wanted Jesus to be done away with. And, you know, it's interesting. There is a difference between envy and jealousy. Jealousy is kind of like uh, there's something that you really love, you like it, and you see someone else who does it better than you, and you're jealous. For instance, like, you know, if I saw someone who was a really good high diver, I would think nothing of that. I would be like, hey, they're a great high diver. But if it was something that I liked, it was a passion of mine, something that I was trying to excel in, I might look at another preacher and say, man, I wish I was eloquent like that. I wish I was funny like that guy. I wish I was a hipster like that guy over there. Not really. But you see what I'm saying? That can happen. Envy is when you want something that someone else has. You want what they have. You're, you're, it's, it's greed. And what Jesus had that they wanted was the love and the appreciation of the people, the authority that Jesus had. And you'll remember at one point that was why they decided that they wanted to kill Him because they were, they were convinced they were going to lose their position. They were going to lose their place of prominence in Israel if things kept going as they were. So they had to get rid of this guy. And Pilate saw through all of that. Pilate knew what was going on. But his hands were tied, so to speak. And uh, they began to cry out, crucify him. And Pilate declared his innocence. Pilate said, there's nothing to charge this guy with. He's done nothing wrong. And that is interesting to me. That's very interesting to me. Jesus was innocent. And he was declared as such by, by Rome, by Pilate. He was the innocent and holy and spotless Lamb of God. The eternal Son of God who never sinned, never broke fellowship with the Father, had never done anything deserving of any type of punishment at all, and he's being declared as innocent, yet still the people are crying out, crucify him. And it's important that we... we Never lose sight of that. We deserve whatever is coming to us. He didn't deserve it. He did not deserve it. We deserve punishment. We deserve hell, quite frankly, for our sins that we have committed against a holy and a righteous and a just God. But Jesus suffered in our stead. Jesus suffered in our place. The righteous for the unrighteous. The holy for the unholy. He was truly innocent. But they wanted Barabbas. They wanted Barabbas. And this is a picture of people choosing darkness rather than light. And the Bible talks about that in John chapter 3. The light came into the world, but people loved what? They loved darkness. They chose darkness. Okay, and so this is a picture of that. It's nothing surprising. We see it all the time. Moving on, verse 16. Then the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole garrison. And they clothed him with purple, and they twisted a crown of thorns, put it on his head, and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews! Then they struck him on the head with a reed and spat on him, and bowing the knee, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took the purple off of him and put his clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him." It wasn't enough for them just to mock him. They had to bring the whole garrison in to be a part of this. And, you know, some of these details I'm glossing over right now. Once I get to a certain point in the text, I'm going to really try to paint a picture of here of all of this collectively. But they brought the whole garrison in. That's a lot of troops so that they could mock him, so that they could... Um, it talks about they struck him on the head with a, a reed. It's basically like a stick. And one of the commentators said... Most likely they had given it to him as like a scepter. He had a, he had a crown of thorns. He had the purple robe, his scepter. And then they put it in his hand, mocked him, took it from him, and beat him with it. 
I mean, they just really mocked this guy. It was so bad. And they dressed him up as royalty. They mocked him with sarcastic homage. Jesus had been condemned by Rome as treasonous, and the soldiers mocked him as such. They said, okay, you're a, you're a king. Okay, we'll salute you like a king. And they mocked him. They struck him. They spit on him. And Isaiah 50, verse 6, is a prophecy about the Messiah, and it talks about in that prophecy that his beard was ripped out. And so it, it, all of that did come to pass in the New Testament, so it's likely that, that that's the, such is the case. They spit on him. They covered his head with a bag and punched him and said, prophesy who hit you. They ripped out his beard. They mocked him. They put the thorns. They forced a crown of thorns down on his head. They put a scepter in his hand and then took it away from him and whipped him in the head with it. And they mocked. And I want you to think about that, guys. Have you ever been mocked before? You know what it feels like. It's a terrible feeling. And so I just consider the, the shame and the humility uh, the humiliation, the mocking. Well, now they're leading him out to be crucified. They're on their way. And so they've left Pilate. Jesus has been scourged already. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But now he's being taken off to the place where he'll be crucified. Verse 21 here, it says, Then they compelled a certain man, Simon a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. So the soldiers had a, law, had a right by law to force somebody to carry a burden for them for a mile. So if the Roman soldiers were passing through a territory and there was something that they wanted to, they needed to haul, they could actually call on citizens uh, or people in that land to carry it for them, but only for a mile. And that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 5.41 where he says, if anyone compels you to go a mile, go two miles. And so that's kind of what Jesus was alluding to, that Roman law. So they call upon this guy, Simon, a Cyrenian, to help Jesus. Jesus is most likely strapped to a crossbeam, which would have been 100 to 150 pounds. And he's already at the brink of death as it is because of the scourging and everything that has gone on. So he can't carry this thing. So they call upon this, this guy who's clearly a, a pilgrim. He's coming to celebrate the feast. They see him. They have him to carry. And just think about that for a moment. What? must that have been like could you imagine to be the one man in human history who was up underneath that cross beam with Jesus helping him carry that and Jesus is beaten and broken and bloody and marred and uh and you're compelled you're forced to get up underneath this beam and carry it uh I mean in in some sense I see that as the highest honor that could be bestowed upon anyone in this in this world to think of that it's that's pretty amazing. And so it's mentioned here that this guy Simon the Cyrenian was the father of Alexander and Rufus. That's interesting. We see those names in the New Testament. We especially see Rufus in Romans 16. Paul addresses Rufus, commends him, commends Rufus's mother. And so we don't know for sure, but if this is uh, the Rufus in Romans 16 as the son of this guy Simon here, it's likely that Simon became a Christian and his whole family did and, and his wife and his, his two sons. And uh, that's just kind of an interesting thing to note. It's odd that, that Mark would make this note here as if everyone knows who these people are. His, uh, usually they'll refer to someone's dad and, as if to say that's their last name, but they don't usually refer to their children unless they're somebody of, of notoriety. So it is possible that Simon became a follower and that his family became kind of prominent members in the early church there. Well, now Jesus is being led off to be crucified. Verse 22. And they brought him to a place, Golgotha, which is translated place of a skull. Then they gave him wine mingled with myrrh to drink, but he did not take it. And when they crucified him, they divided his garments, casting lots for them to determine what every man should take. Now it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the inscription of his accusation was written above, the king of the Jews. With him they also crucified two robbers, one on his right hand and the other on his left. So the scripture was fulfilled which says, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, Aha, you who destroyed the temple and built it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. 
Likewise, the chief priest also mocking among themselves with the scribes said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. Even those who were crucified with him reviled him. I mean, this is as bad as it gets. You know, something that I, I had marked in your notes, I failed to mention. You know, when the soldiers were ridiculing Jesus and mocking him, in my opinion, I mean, we're seeing full on demonic hatred, torment. I mean, this is not natural. This is, I mean, humans can do some pretty bad things, but this is really bad. I mean, this, I, I really believe that these guys on some level are, are operating under the, the hatred of evil forces and they're mocking. And I think in some way this could be a picture of what hell would look like as demons are tormenting and mocking you and the suffering uh, that, that happens in a place like that. It, it almost seems picturesque to me of that very thing. Which makes sense being that Jesus suffered uh, our condemnation. He suffered it all. You know, and the, uh, all of that. So, anyways, at this point, he's being led to a place called Golgotha. It's literally the place of the skull. It's possible it was called this because it was littered with skulls from all the executions that hap had happened here. It's possible that because of all the rocks in the land that there was a big boulder-like area that looked like a skull. Don't really know. But as he was uh, crucified, they tried to give him... Uh, wine mixed with myrrh, this was actually a numbing agent. It was something that on some level would have helped to alleviate the pain, and he refused it. That is amazing to me. Jesus went into this thing fully sober with all of his faculties. He did not try to escape it on any level. He didn't fight against it. He didn't defend himself. He didn't try to escape it at all. He didn't even try to escape the pain on any level. He fully embraced the cross for us. In the deepest and truest sense, He underwent the agony of the cross and the suffering that was bound up in that uh, with total sobriety. That is amazing to me. Jesus refused it. He took the full weight of the suffering, the pain, the shame, the mocking. Well, Jesus is crucified. He's crucified now. And I want to talk a little bit about that. One, He's already been scourged. And a lot of you probably know this, but he's basically whipped 39 times with a cat of nine tails. And so it would have little pieces of iron, little shards of bone, and, and things of the sort. So that when you would get whipped, it would, uh, the, the little balls of iron obviously would beat you. But then the shrapnel would embed down into your skin. And then when they pull it back, it would just rip your flesh open. And they did this 39 times. Now this was a tactic to get... Um, a confession. And so the idea is, is that they start hard and they'll go easier and easier as you confess. But Jesus didn't have anything to confess. So odds are it got harder and harder and harder to the very end. Generally, it wasn't uncommon for someone to die under a scourging. Okay, so Jesus has been scourged. But let's go back even farther. Jesus had already been sweating great drops of blood in the garden when He knew this was coming. He was under such... Have you ever experienced stress and anxiety? I mean, to a detrimental level. I'm sure some of you here know what that's like. Jesus was sweating blood. He had so much anxiety and grief. The, the, the dread of the horror that would come, He was already there. But then He was betrayed. Anybody in here ever been betrayed before? He was betrayed, but then he was abandoned. The, one, the ones who had not betrayed him, they abandoned him and left him there. So he had been betrayed and abandoned by those who were closest to him. And then he's humiliated. He's mocked. He's spit on. His beard is ripped out. He's whipped, crowned with thorns. They worshipped him. They blasphemed him. When I say worship, I mocking worship. And then he was scourged, as I just mentioned. And in the midst of all this, generally when this is happening, they'll strip you naked. And so as you're being uh, driven out like this, you're stripped and beaten and then hanging on a cross naked. I mean, he could not have been humiliated any more than he, than he was. It, it could not have been any worse. But then 
all of that doesn't even compare to what happened to him on that cross when he bore the sin of the world. When he bore the sin, our sins, on himself on that cross, and then he bore not just our sins, but rape, murder, you name it, as bad as it gets, it was on him. The holy, spotless, beautiful, blameless Son of God who has existed from all of eternity past in perfect fellowship with the Heavenly Father who never, ever knew corruption or taint carried the most disgusting and vile, deepest and darkest sins upon Himself on that cross. And then it got even worse. The Father, the Father, as it were, turned His face away. I looked into that. What does that mean? We say that a lot. The Father turned His face away. It's not in the... It's not literally in the Bible. The idea is that in the Old Testament, it talks about how God cannot look on. God and and holiness and purity cannot look upon sin. He can't do it. And so when His Son carried the sin of the world, God could not look upon His own Son. As the Father crushed His Son on the cross, as He bore the weight of sin of all of humanity, and then He drank the wrath of God that was meant for the nations. He drank my hell. He drank your hell. He did that upon the cross. He suffered that shame, the separation from the Father as the Father, as it were, turned His face away. He could not look upon His Son. And He did that for us. And He did that willingly. He came for that very reason. That was why He came. His hour had come. And He did that for us. I'm going to talk more about that in a minute. But meanwhile, while this is happening, they're casting lots. People are on the ground. The soldiers, are, they, they want to take Jesus' garments. And so they're, they're casting lots to decide who's going to get what. That's the fulfillment of Psalm 22. For dogs have surrounded me. The congregation of the wicked have enclosed me. They've pierced my hands and my feet. This is in the Psalms, guys. Psalm 22, they pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Well, it also says that he was numbered with the transgressors. Again, this is a fulfillment of Isaiah 53, 12. In your notes, you'll notice there. It says, therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. So, Jesus was numbered among the transgressors. That means that he died between two common thieves on a cross. He died with the wicked. The, he, his death was with the wicked, the, the innocent righteous one. Now everyone's mocking him. The Roman soldiers had already been mocking him, and now the religious rulers are mark, mocking him. Those people who are passing by are mocking him. Even the guys on the cross on both sides are mocking him. I mean, this is unbelievable. And they're saying, save yourself. Save yourself. You could save other people, you can't save yourself. And this is just it. That's what they would have done for themselves in that situation because that's exactly what we do. We preserve self. That is one of the number one human instincts is self-preservation. And that's exactly what they would have done in that situation, but not Jesus. The Son of Man came to give His life as a ransom for many. He did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom. That's exactly what He did. That's what they would have done. They would have saved themselves. But He didn't come to save Himself. He came to save those who would confess His name and turn from their sins and come to God in faith. He came to save the lost. So He didn't come to save Himself. He came to save others. So verse 33 here, moving on. Now when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
And some of those who stood by when they heard it said, look, he's calling for Elijah. Then someone ran and filled a sponge full of sour wine and put it on a reed and offered it to him to drink, saying, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come and take him down. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. So Jesus hung on that cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And from 12 to 3, darkness fell on all of the land. And at this point, Jesus cries out in, in his humanity. I've talked about this before. You'll see times where, where Jesus is clearly operating. He is God in the flesh. That never changes. He's always God. But at the same time, he is God dwelling in flesh. And so at times, we'll kind of get a glimpse of Jesus in his humanity when he's weak, when he's anxious to the point of sweating blood, or he's hungry, he's thirsty, he's, he's tired, he's weak. And here he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some people believe, some scholars have suggested that when this darkness fell, this supernatural occurrence, this was the point in which Jesus was actually experiencing the weight of sin on him and, and God was judging sin on the cross at this point. And this is from Psalm, Psalms 22, 1. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groanings? So this is prophetic fulfillment from the Psalms. Jesus on the cross crying out as the Father was judging him, really judging the sins upon the cross. But then it says that, uh, that he cried out with a loud voice. And we know that from John 19.30, what did he cry out? It is finished. It is finished. And that is beautiful. That is, that is such a beautiful thing. I know that this is heavy, guys, and I'm, and I'm trying to, to, to do that. I'm not, I don't want to make little of this or gloss over it. I want you to feel the weight and the intensity of all of this. But this is beautiful. Jesus came to accomplish the work of salvation. That's what that means. I have done everything that is necessary. I have paid for it all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed me white as snow. He died on the cross and he cried out, it is finished. Everything that was necessary. Remember when he said, if this cup could, can pass, let it pass. If there's any other way that salvation can be accomplished, let it be. There was no other way. Jesus drank the cup. He died on the cross. He suffered and now it's finished. And now we we experience the freedom that comes from knowing Jesus. We have been born again. Our sins have been washed away. Our sins were nailed to that cross. The handwritten, handwriting of the, the requirements of the law nailed to the cross. And now we are free. And who the Son sets free is what? Free, free indeed. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. It is finished. Jesus did all of that for us, for love's sake. Because God is merciful, because God is gracious, because God is willing that none should perish, but that we would all come to the knowledge of Him, that we would all have eternal, everlasting life with Him. If we would put our trust in Christ, if we would repent of our sins, if we would put our faith in Him, the finished work of the cross, the finished work of the cross. Jesus cried out, it is finished. Verse 38 then the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. So when the centurion who stood opposite him saw that he cried out like this and breathed his last, he said, truly this man was the Son of God. This is the veil. This was the last point of entry into the holy, the holy place, the holiest of holies in the temple. Only one person could go in there one time a year, and it was the high priest, and he would go in there to make intercession for the nation of Israel a covering for their sins and now the veil is torn because of what Christ has done we can go boldly into the throne room of grace we can go boldly into the presence of God because the veil has been torn we don't need someone to go on our behalf we don't it's not just centralized to one location where God is in that place and we can go there one time a year no we can have access to God all the time now, wherever we go, in our car, at home, in this church building, at school, at work, walking down the road, the veil is torn. We have access to the holiest of holies because now it's right here. 
Now that God dwells in you, you are the temple of God. The veil has been torn. Some have said that this veil may have been 18 inches thick, just cloth that was uh, upon cloth upon cloth sewn together. Imagine the, the sound, what that would have looked like when that ripped like that. Because the veil was torn and there is no longer separation between God and His people. Verse 40, There were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the less, and of Joseph and of Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him when he was in Galilee, and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So now we, we give, are given this note of these women who are at the cross with Jesus. Mary of Magdala, Mary Magdalene, whom Jesus had casted out seven demons. For some reason, people tend to think that she had been a prostitute, but there was no reason to, to uh, assume that. Uh, Mary, the mother of James, the less, that means he was the younger of his, of his brother, he was the less, and uh, Salome, who was the mother of James and John. Interesting thing to consider, it wasn't too long before this that she came to Jesus and said, can my sons be on your right and left hand in your glory? And Jesus said, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? And they said, yes, we can. And he said, oh, you will. You will, but you, uh, it's not mine to give. And so when she's standing here looking at this, I can't help but think that that flashed back to her mind of, uh, of that very question. At this point, all the disciples, the 12 apostles, they're gone. We know that John was there, John the apostle. He was the youngest of the disciples, maybe in his late teens. He was there, and then these female disciples, they were there adoring Jesus to the very very end. They were there. And we know uh, sometime while Jesus was on the cross, he actually entrusted his mother Mary to John the Apostle's care. He placed his mom into her care while he was hanging on the cross. So they're still here and they are they're, uh, adoring Jesus to the very end. That, that amazes me. And now verse 42. We'll kind of close with this. Now when evening had come, because it was the preparation day, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a prominent council member, who was himself waiting for the kingdom of God, coming and taking courage, went into Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the centurion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. So when he found out from the centurion, he granted the body to Joseph. Then he bought fine linen, took him down, and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in the tomb, which had been hewn out of the rock, and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. And Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joseph observed where he was laid. Now typically people would hang on a cross for days. They could hang there for, uh, for a couple of days. And one thing I failed to mention earlier, part of what happens on the cross is they can't breathe um, so what they have to do because of the way they're hanging, they have to push up on their feet and come up and gasp for air and then drop slump back down. And so they're just doing that the whole time they're on the cross and because it'll suffocate them. And so you consider Jesus' back had already been, he didn't have a back anymore and he was just scrubbing up and down on this cross like that. And so uh, the Pharisees came, the, or the religious leaders, they wanted the bodies off of the cross because the next day was a holy day. And so they, want, they couldn't have uh, people hanging during that time. So they wanted to hasten the death. So that's why they came up and broke the legs of the guys on the left and the right so that they could stop fighting, it, fighting the suffocation and would just die. They would suffocate to death. And Jesus, they, there was a prophecy about no bones being broken. So they were going to break his legs and then they realized he was already dead. And so they pierced his side. And you remember blood and water came out? And that was another prophecy they would look upon him whom they pierced. And so uh, they, they wanted to hasten the death, but Jesus was already dead. And uh, Pilate marveled at this, but it's not really that shocking because a lot of people don't even survive the scourging. And so Jesus, but Jesus was in charge of even his death. No one took his life from him, he gave it. And so at the time when the time was right, when it was finished, he breathed his last. He was out of here. And we're told that Joseph of Arimathea came and took him down. It's interesting, this is one of those instances where if you put all the different Gospels together, each one gives you a slightly different or a little bit of extra information about this guy. That's the benefit to 
reading the different Gospels. So I kind of have here in your notes a paragraph about Joseph of Arimathea. I won't really go into that. You can read that if you want to, but it's pretty insightful. He was a disciple of Jesus. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a secret disciple. He did not consent to Jesus' death. We find that out. And eventually he came out. He came out of hiding and, and, and exposed himself and asked for the body of Jesus. And we find out Nicodemus was with him. So Nicodemus did the same thing. So they, they took his body down and put him in his own grave. And that was prophecy. Isaiah 53, 9 here, it says, And they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death, because he had no violence had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. So he died with the wicked, but his grave was with the rich. He had a rich man's tomb. Joseph of Arimathea put Jesus in his own tomb, but Jesus just borrowed the tomb. He didn't need it for long. And uh, what's interesting here, Pilate verified that Jesus was dead. He, he, he made sure. Some people have suggested that Jesus never actually died. He was just close to death, and they took him off the cross, and and he kind of resuscitated and came back. But these guys were professional executioners. They knew death when they saw it. And Pilate even verified with the centurion, are you sure? Yes, he died. He was dead, dead. And the women took note of where Jesus was laid because they were going to return to his tomb. But guess what? Jesus won't be there. Jesus won't be there because he will rise again. And so this is glorious, guys, and I want to close with this. And Joe, if you would come up and close us with a song. I want you to feel the weight. I want you to understand what Christ did. But he did that so that we wouldn't have to. This ought to drive you. This ought to compel you to a place of gratitude, to a place of surrender, to a place of obedience, to a place of worship, to a place of rejoicing, to a place of gratitude, to a place of sharing with others. When we consider that we have been set free, that we have been forgiven, our sins are washed away, past, present, and future. We are new creations in Christ. We have eternal life that will never be taken away from us. And we have a loving relationship with the God right now who is for us. And if he wasn't willing, if he was willing, let me say it this way, if he was willing to give his son, if he did not withhold his only son, how then will he not freely give all things? Romans talks about that. God is for you. If he was willing to give his son like this when we were enemies, when they were enemies, Christ died for the ungodly. How much more is God for you now as a beloved child of the Most High? That's a beautiful thing. We have a reason to celebrate. This is glorious news. The glory of the cross, the wonders of the cross upon which our Savior died, that we would be set free and that we would have a loving relationship with God so that we could have healing. The Lord has come to bring healing in this life. God has come to bring restoration in this life. God has come to do a new thing in your life and to use you for His glory in this life. And it's all because of the cross. It's all because of, of the horrors of what He suffered so that we wouldn't have to. Amen? That's a beautiful thing. We have something to worship Him for. Let's worship Him. Let's pray. Father, we love You. We praise Your holy name. We thank You that You were willing to pay such a high price. You were willing to send Your Son. And Jesus, we thank You that You didn't come to save or preserve Your life. You came to give it and you did not waver from that. And you gave your life for us upon that cross. You suffered and you bore our sin and our guilt upon you and it is gone, it is removed as far as the east is from the west and now we celebrate as we are justified. We have been made right before you, Father. Now we can sing and we can dance in freedom knowing that we have a loving relationship with You and that You're for us and that You work all things together for our good and for Your glory and that You've begun a good work and You are faithful to complete that good work. We have that assurance. We know that we can come to You and that You delight to hear us and You delight to do a wonderful work for Your name's sake because of Your Son. Thank You, Jesus, that You were willing to suffer, to be mocked, to be ridiculed, to be tortured, to be despised, to be forsaken and betrayed and crushed for us. Thank you for that, Jesus. We love you. We worship you in this place. Receive honor and glory from your people. 
We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.